chapter 109, sleep. Then they came out of the narrow valley, and at once she saw the reason. There stood Peter and Edmund and all the rest of Aslan's army, fighting desperately against the crowd of horrible creatures whom she had seen last night. Only now, in the daylight, they looked even stranger and more evil and more deformed. I stopped there. I'd been reading for over an hour and sleep still didn't come. It was almost 2 a.m. Everyone else was asleep. I had my flashlight on under the sleeping bag, and maybe the light was why I couldn't sleep, but I was too afraid to turn it off. I was afraid of how dark it was outside the sleeping bag. When we got back to our section in front of the movie screen, no one had even, had even noticed we'd been gone. Mr. Tashman and Miss Rubin and Summer and all the rest of the kids were just watching the movie. They had no clue how something bad had almost happened to me and Jack. It's so weird how that can be. How you could have a night that's the worst in your life, but to everybody else it's just an ordinary night. Like on my calendar at home, I would mark this as being one of the most horrific days of my life. This and the day Daisy died, but for the rest of the world, this was just an ordinary day. Or maybe it was even a good day. Maybe somebody won the lottery today. Amos, Miles and Henry brought me and Jack over to where we'd been sitting before, with Summer and Maya and Raid, and then they went and sat where they had been sitting, before with Cinema, Cinema and Savannah and their group. In a way, everything was exactly as we had left it before we went looking for the toilets. The sky was the same. The movie was the same. Everyone's faces were the same. Mine was the same. But something was different. Something had changed. I could see Amos and Miles and Henry telling their group what had just happened. I knew they were talking about it because they kept looking over at me while they were talking. Even though the movie was still playing, people were whispering about it in the dark. News like that spreads fast. It was what everyone was talking about on the bus ride back to the cabins. All the girls, even girls I don't know very well, were asking me if I was okay. The boys were all talking about getting revenge on the group of 7th grade jerks, trying to figure out what school they were from. I wasn't plan. I wasn't planning on telling the teachers any about any of what had what had happened about what had happened. I wasn't planning on telling the teachers about any of what had happened, but they found out anyway. Maybe it was the torn sweatshirt and the bloody elbow, or maybe it's just that the teachers hear everything. When we got back to the camp, Mr. Tashman took me to the first aid office, and while I was getting my elbow cleaned and bandaged up by the camp nurse, Mr. Tashman and the camp director were in the next room, talking with Amos and Jack and Henry and Miles, trying to get a description of the troublemakers. When he asked me about them a little later, I said I couldn't remember their faces at all, which wasn't true. It's their faces I kept seeing every time, every time I closed my eyes to sleep. The look of total horror on the girl's face when she first saw me. The way the kid with the flashlight, Eddie, looked at me as he talked to me, like he hated me. Like a lamb to the slaughter. I remember that saying that ages ago, but tonight I think I finally got what it meant. Camp flies. My parents got divorced. The summer before ninth grade, my father was with someone else right away. In fact, though my mother never said so, I think this was the reason they got divorced. After the divorce, I hardly ever saw my father, and my mother acted stranger than ever. It's not that she was unstable or anything, just distant, remote. My mother is the kind of person who has a happy face for the rest of the world but not a lot left over for me. She's never talked to me much, not about her feelings, her life. I don't know much about what she was like when she was my age. 
don't know much about the things she liked or didn't like. The few times she mentioned her own parents, who I never met, it was mostly about how she wanted to get as far away from them as she could once she grown up. She never told me why. I asked a few times, but she would pretend she hadn't heard me. I didn't want to go to camp that summer. I had wanted to stay with her to help her through the divorce, but she insisted I go away. I figured that she wanted to the alone time, so I gave it to her. Camp was awful. I hated it. I thought it would be better being a junior counselor, but it wasn't. No one I knew from the previous year and had come back, so I didn't know anyone, not a single person. I'm not even sure why, but I started playing this little make-believe game with the girls in the camp. They asked me stuff about myself, and I make things up. My parents are in Europe. I told them, I live in a huge townhouse on the Nine Street in North River Heights. I have a dog named Daisy. Then one day, I blurted out that I had a little brother who had, was deformed. I have absolutely no idea why I said this. It just seemed like an interesting thing to say, and of course. The reaction I got from the little girls in the blue gallow was drama dramatic. Really? So sorry. This would be tough, etc., etc. Et I regretted saying the moment it escaped from lips. Of course, I feel like such a fake. If Fia ever found down, I thought she'd think I was such a waiter, and I felt like a waiter. But I have to admit. There was a part of me that felt a little entitled to this life. I've known Augie since I was six years old. I've watched him grow up. I've played with him. I've watched all six episodes of Star Wars for his sake, so I could talk to him about the aliens and bounty hunters and all that. I am the one that gave him astronaut helmet, though he wouldn't take off for two years. I mean, I've kind of earned the right to think of him as my brother. And the strangest thing is that this lie I told these fictions did wonders for my popularity. Though all the junior counselors hear from the campers, and they were all over it. Never in my life have I ever been considered one of the popular girls in anything. But that summer camp in camp, for whatever reason. I, it, I was the girl everybody wanted to hang out with. Even in the girls in Bugalo, 32 were totally into me. These were the girl at the top of the food chain. They said they liked the hair, though they changed it. They said they liked the way I did my makeup, though they changed that too. They showed me how to turn my t-shirts into how to put tops. The smoke, we smoke. We snuck out late at night and took the bat through the woods to the boy boys' camp. We hunt out with boys. When I got home from camp, I called Ella right away to make a plan with her. I don't know why I didn't call Via. I guess I just didn't feel like talking about stuff with her. She would have asked me about my parents, about camp. Ella never really asked me about things. She was an easier friend to have in that way. She wasn't serious like Via. She was fun. She thought it was cool when I dyed my hair pink. She wanted to hear all about those trips through the wood late at night. School. I hardly saw Via at school this year, and when I did, it was awkward. It felt like she was judging me. I knew she didn't like my new look. I knew she didn't like my group of friends. I didn't much like her. We never actually argued, we just drifted away. Ella and I bad mouth her to each other. She's such a brute. She saw this, she saw that. We knew we were being mean, but it was easier to ask her out if we pretended she had done something to us. The truth is she hadn't changed at all we had. We become these other people and she was still the person she's always been. That annoyed me so much and I didn't know why.
Once in a while, I look to see where she was sitting in the lunchroom or check the elective list to see what she signed up for. But except for a few knocks in the hallway and an occasional hello, we never really spoke to each other. I noticed just then about halfway through the school year, I hadn't noticed him at all before then. Other than that, he was this skinny cutish dude with thick glasses and longish hair who carried a violin everywhere. Then one day, I saw him in front of the school with his arm around Via. So Via has a boyfriend, I said to Ella, kind of mocking. I don't know why it surprised me that she'd have a boyfriend. Out of the three of us, she was totally the prettiest, blue blue eyes and long wavy dark hair. But she just never acted like she was at all interested in boys. She acted like she was too smart for that kind of stuff. I had a boyfriend too, a guy named Zach. When I told him I was using a theater elective, he shook his head and said, Careful you didn't turn into a giant geek. Not the most sympathetic dude in the world, but very cute. Very high up on the totem pole of varsity jump. I wasn't planning on taking theater at first. Then I saw Via's name on the sign-up sheet and just wrote my name down on the list. I don't even know why we managed to avoid one another throughout most of the semester, like we didn't even know each other. Then one day, I got to theater class a little early and David Park asked me to run off additional copies of the play he was planning on having us do for the spring production, The Elephant Man. I'd heard about it, but I didn't really know what it was about, so I started skimming through the pages while I was waiting for the Xerox machine. It was about a man who lived more than a hundred years ago named John Merrick, who was terribly deformed. We can't do this play, Mr. D. I told him when I got back to class and I told him why. My little brother has a birth defect and has a deformed face and this boy would hit too close to home. He seemed annoyed and a little unsympathetic, but I kind of said that my parents would have a real issue with the school doing this play, so anyway he ended up switching to our town. I think I went for the role of Emily Gibbs because I knew Via was going to go for it too. It never occurred to me that I beat her for the role. What I miss most one of the things I meet the most about Via's friendship is her family. I loved her mom and dad. They were always so welcoming and nice to me. I knew I lo they loved their kids more than anything. I always felt safe around them, safer than anywhere else in the world. How pathetic that I felt safer in someone else's house than in my own, right? And, of course, I loved Augie. I was never afraid of him, even when I was little. I had friends that couldn't believe I'd ever go over to V's house. He face creeps me out, they'd say. You were stupid, I'd tell them. Augie's face isn't so bad once you get used to it. I called V's house once just to say hello to Augie. Maybe part of me was hoping V would answer. I don't know. Hey, Major Tom, I said, using my nickname for him. Miranda, he sounded so happy to hear my voice. It actually kind of took me by surprise. I'm going to a regular school now, he told me excitedly. Really? Wow, I said, totally shocked. I guess I never thought he'd go to a regular school. His parents his parents always been so protective of him. I guess I thought he'd always be that little kid in the astronaut helmet I give him. Talking to him, I could tell he had no idea that Veer and I weren't so close anymore. It's different in high school, I explained to him. You end up hanging out with lots of different people. I have some friends at my new school, he told me, a kid named Jack and a girl named Summer. That's awesome, Augie, I said. Well, I was just calling you to tell you I miss you and hope you will, you are having a good year. 
feel free to call me whenever you want. Okay, I'll give. You know, I'll all. I love you always. I love you too, Miranda. Say hi to Vera for me. Tell her I miss her. I will. Bye, bye. Extraordinary, but no one there to see. Neither my mother nor my father could come see the play on opening night. My mother, because she had these things at work, and my dad, because his new wife was going to have her baby any second now, and he had to be on call. Zach couldn't come to opening night either. He had a volleyball game against Collegiate, and he couldn't miss. In fact, he had wanted me to miss the opening night so I could come cheer him on. My friends all went to the game, of course, because all their boyfriends were playing. Even Ella didn't come. Given a choice, she chose the crown. So on opening night, no one that was remotely close to me was even there. And the thing is, I realized. In my third or fourth rehearsal, that I was good at this acting thing. I felt the part. I understood the words I spoke. I could read the lies as if they were coming from my brain and my heart. And on opening night, I can honestly say, I knew I was going to be more than good. I was going to be great. I was going to be extraordinary. But there would be no one there to see. We were all backstage, nervously running through the, our lives in our heads. I peeked through the curtain at the people taking their seats in the auditorium. That's when I saw Augie walking down the aisle with Isabel and Nate. They took. Three seats in the fifth row near the middle. Augie was wearing a bow tie, looking around excitedly. He had grown up a bit since I'd last seen him, almost a year ago. His hair was shorter, and he was wearing some kind of hearing aid now. His face hadn't changed a bit. Davenport. Was running through some last-minute changes with the set decorator. I saw Justin pacing off stage left, mumbling his lines nervously. Mr. Davenport, I said, surprising myself as I spoke. I'm sorry, but I can't go on tonight. Davenport turned around slowly. What? He said. I'm sorry. Are you kidding? I'm just, I'm murdered. Looking down, I don't feel well. I'm sorry. I feel like I'm going to throw, throw up. This was a lie. It's just last minute tears. No, I can't do it. I'm tell, I'm telling you. Davenport looked furious. Miranda, this is outer. This outrageous. I'm sorry. Davenport took a deep breath, like he was trying to restrain himself. To be truthful, I thought he looked like he was going to explode. His forehead turned bright pink. Miranda, this is absolutely unacceptable. Now go take a few deep breaths and. I'm not going on. I said loudly, and the tears came to my eyes fairly easily. Fine, he screamed, not looking at me. Then he turned to a kid named David, who was a set decorator. Go find Olivia in the lighting booth. Tell her she's filling in for Miranda tonight. What? Said David, who wasn't too swift. Go. Shouted Davenport in his face. Now, the other kids had caught on to what was going, what was happening, and gathered around. What's going on? Said Justin. Last minute change of plans. 
said Davenport. Miranda doesn't feel well. I feel sick, I said, trying to sound sick. So why are you still here? Davenport said to me angrily. Stop talking. Take off your costume and give it to Olivia. Okay? Come on, everybody. Let's go, go, go. I ran backstage to the dressing room as quickly as I could, and started peeling off my costume. Two seconds later, there was a knock, and Via half opened the door. "What's going on?" she said. "Hurry up, put it on." I answered, handing her the dress. "You're sick." "Yeah, hurry up." Via looked stunned. Took off her T-shirt. And jeans and pulled the long dress over her head. I pulled it down for her and then zipped up the back. Luckily, Emily Webb didn't go on until ten minutes into the play, so the girl handling hair and makeup had time to put Vera's head up in the twist and do a quick makeup job. I'd never seen Vera with a lot, a lot of makeup on. She looked like a model. I'm not even sure I will remember my lies. Via said, looking at herself in the mirror, "Your lies. You will do great." I said. She looked at me in the mirror. Why are you doing this, Miranda? Olivia. It was Davenport. Hush, shouting from the door. You are on in two minutes. It's now or never. Via followed him out of the, out the door. So I never got a chance to answer her question. I don't know what I would have said anyway. I wasn't sure what the answer was. Chapter ninety six. The performance. I watched the rest of the play from the wings just off deck, next to David Pop. Justin was amazing, and Bea, in that heartbreaking last scenes, was awesome. There was one line she flopped a bit, but Justin carved for her. And no one in the audience even noticed. I heard David Pot muttering under his breath, "Good, good, good." He was more nervous than all of the students put together. The actors, the set decorators, the lighting team, the guy handling the curtains. David Pot was a wreck, frankly. The only time I felt any regret, if you could even call it that, was at the end of the play when everyone went out for their certain calls. Bea and Justin were the last of the actors walking out on stage. And the audience rose to their feet when they took their bows. That I admit was a little bit too sweet for me. But just a few minutes later, I saw Ned and Isabel and Augie make their way backstage, and they all seemed so happy. Everyone was congratulating the actors, patting them on the back. It was a crazy backstage theater mayhem where sweetie actors stand euphoric while people come worship them for seconds. In that crowd of people. I noticed Ogi looking kind of lost. I got through the crowd as fast as I could and came up behind him. Hey, I said, Mr. Tom. Chapter eight. After the show, I can't say why I was so happy to see August again after so long, or how good it felt when he hurt me. I can't believe how big you've gotten. I said to him. I thought you were going to be in the play. He said. I wasn't up to it. I said. But Via was great, don't you think? Here he nodded.、Uh, two seconds later, Isabel frowned. Miranda, she said happily, giving me a kiss on the cheek, and then to August, don't ever disappear like that again. You are the one who disappeared. Algy answered back. How you feeling?、Uh, Isabel said to me. Via told us you were sick. Much better, I answered. Is your mom here? Said Isabel. No, she had more stuff, so it's actually not a big deal for me. I said truth, truthfully, we have two more show anyway, so, so I don't think it will be as good as、uh, Emily as we are was tonight.、Uh, Nick came over, and we had basically the same exact conversation. That that Isabel said, "Look, we are going to have a late night dinner to celebrate the show. Are you feeling up to joining us?" We do. We would like to have you. Oh no! I start to say, please," said Algie. "You should go home," I said. We insist," said Ned. By now, Via and Justin has come over with Justin's mum, and Via put her arm around me. 
You're definitely coming, and she said, smiling her old smile at me. They start leading me out of the crowd, and I have to admit for the first, for the first time in a very, very long time, I felt absolutely happy. Chapter 98 The Fifth Great Nature Retreat in the spring, the fifth graders of Beecher Creek go away for three days and two nights to a place called the Broadgood Nature Reserve in Dancing Banner. It is a four-hour bus drive away. The kids sleep in cabins with bunk beds. There are camp campfires and s'mores and long words to the goods. The teachers have been prepping us about this this all year long, so all the kids in the grades are excited about it, except for me. And it's not even that I'm not excited, because I, I'm tired and it's just, I've never slept away from home before and I'm kind of nervous. Most kids have had sleepovers. Oh, by the time they are my age, a lot of kids have gone to sleepaway camps or, or, or stayed, or stayed with their grandparents or whatever. Not me. Not unless you include hospital stays. But even then, mom or dad always stayed, stayed, stayed with me all the night. But I never said over Tata and Popa's house or Aunt Kate and Uncle Paul's house. When I was um, really little, that's were mainly because there were too many, too many medical issues. Like my turkey tooth needing to be cleared every hour or research my feeding tube if, I, if it got detached. But when it got bigger, I just never felt like sleeping anywhere else. And there, there was one time when I half slept over Christopher's house. We were about eight and we were still best friends. Our family had gone for a visit to his house and me and, and me and Christopher were having such a great time playing Legos. Star Wars that I didn't want to leave when it was time to go. We were like, please, 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 can we have a sleepover? So our parents say, said yes, and mom and dad and we are drove home. And me and Christopher stayed up till midnight playing until Lisa, his mom, said, okay, guys, time to go to bed. Well, that's when I kind of panicked, panicked a bit. Lisa tried to help me go to sleep, but I just started crying um, that I wanted to go home. So at 1 a.m., Lisa called mom and dad, and they drove all the way back out to Bridport to pick me up. We didn't get home until 3 a.m., so my one and my only sleep and my only sleepovers, sleepover up, un, up until now was pretty much of a disaster, which is why I'm a little nervous about the nature retreat. On the other hand, I'm really excited. Known for, I asked mom to buy me a new rolling duffel bag because my old one has Star Wars stuff on it, and there was no way. I was going to take that to be great nature retreat. As much as I love Star Wars, I don't want that to be what I'm known for. Everyone's known for something in middle school, like Reed is known for being really and for really being into marine life and the ocean and things like that. And Amos is known for being a really good baseball player. And Charlotte is known for having been in a TV commercial when she was six and Samana, known for being really smart. My point is that in middle school, you kind of get known for what you're into, and you have to be careful about stuff like that, like Smatry and Masked Up Blue were never left down the jungle and dragon obsession. 
so I was actually trying to ease out the whole story thing a bit. I mean, it's always be special to me, like it is with the doctor who put in my hearing aid. It's just not the things I wanted to be known for in middle school. I'm not sure what I want to be known for, but it's not that. That's not exactly true. I do know what I'm really known for, but there's nothing I can do about that. A Star Wars duffel bag, I could do something about.